Uh, good morning. It's so good to see all of you. A beautiful day in San Francisco. I rode my bike in this morning and it was just shining. Um, October is the best month of the year for the light in the cathedral. It's so beautiful. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral. It's a blessing to have all of you here today for the forum. Every year, the cathedral chooses a theme to unify and inspire us and our community. This year, the theme is the body. When we started thinking about guests we wanted to have at the forum, we immediately thought of our guest today, much of whose work explores aspects of the body, including the beauty myth, promiscuities, misconceptions, vagina a biography, and most recently, outrages, sex, censorship, and the criminalization of love. These books, in part, look at how society and cultural norms can affect, often negatively, the freedom we have with our bodies. Our guest is a Rhodes Scholar, a former advisor to both the Bill Clinton and Al Gore campaigns, author of eight nonfiction bestsellers, and a frequent commentator on politics and culture. She's also local. She was born in San Francisco and attended Lowell High School. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Wolf. So I'm going to do something that I, when um, our guests do this, I hate it when our guests do this, but I'm, I, what I would like to do is start by reading a little section from Walt Whitman. Sure, how appropriate. Just kind of evoke yeah. the Walt Whitman spirit yes. as we begin. You can see my book is just barely holding on here. Only delicate, delicate hands. So this is from Song of Myself. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me he complains of my gab and my loitering. I, too, am not a bit tamed. I, too, am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yop over the roofs of the world. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness. Don't you just love that? <laughs> I, 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 I more than love it. I mean, should I just jump in? I've been waiting for someone else who loves Walt Whitman to appear on my life on the <laughs> stage. <laughs> so yeah, that is my first question, is yeah. just um, when did you first encounter Walt Whitman and, and what did it mean to you? Because it, it's so singular and unique and powerful and, um, and, and I loved learning more about um, kind of the reception history of Leaves of Grass. Thank you. Um, can I respond to your lovely yes, welcome please before do. I answer that? So I just want to thank the Dean and thank Rebecca Nestle and her incredible team and thank all of you for being here. Um, uh, and I just want to address something, which is that two, two things. Grace Cathedral, when I was first invited, um, I was starstruck, and I don't easily get starstruck because Grace has been such an inspiration to me, such an influence, the community and the cathedral, but the way that this community has always, and this leadership, which is so rare, has always, in the time I was growing up, the time I was a young woman, a grown-up, every time I came back to San Francisco, sh shown, walked the talk of what Jesus, whom I as a Jewish lady see as a radical rabbi, right, yes. said we should do. And the fact that Grace was at the forefront during the AIDS crisis of um, the Names Project and always stood with people who were sick, always stood with people who were dying, with people who were ostracized, with marginalized groups, with the poor, with the downtrodden, with women, social justice, so consistently, I, I literally, I had to like stop myself from constantly gushing and, you know, bothering Rebecca with how excited I was to be here. And, and my time here, though brief, has shown me that everything I've always felt about Grace is, is true. The other thing I want to address just before we plunge in is that this is kind of a historic gathering for me, and I need to tell you why. The book has been canceled in the United States. There was a press release that came out on the wires about this yesterday. So this, is the, this basement is literally the only place know, right. in North America where you can get this book. Um, it is virtually, I don't want to say, it, you cannot get it legally anywhere in the United States. It's not like you're doing something wrong or committing a criminal act, but it's so ironic. This is a book about how difficult it is to to bring a book into the world. Right. And um, I just wanted to share that this has happened. And uh, I am quite sure that it will, you know, find another North American publisher. But I just wanted to applaud Grace and the Dean and everyone because it would be very easy at such a controversial moment to not have this conversation. And the book is about how important it is to have the conversations that are not being had. So I just want to like get that elephant in the room out there. Thank you for being here. You know, thank you, Rebecca, for 
you know, unpacking that crate of books from Britain, you know, and, and I, I really believe, you know, whether you uh, like or don't like this story, you know, it's so important to have the conversations that are, are not being brought into the light. Yeah, and, you know, uh, so I read half of it before the, the announcement on Friday about the, the press release about from the publisher, and half of it after. So I think I'm the only person to have read it since that happened. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so um, it, it, what it means kind of is amazing. that um, all these things that are in there that you wrote um, sitting in, in Oxford or sitting in New York City, I mean, you had no idea that your book would be an exact um, reflection of what, what you're describing. So even just like when you commend publishers for their courage and publishing difficult pieces, when you write about publishers being incarcerated, uh, you know, booksellers put in jail, you know, uh, all that, um, it, you were, you were, you're, it, it's, it's a, such a crazy set of ironies and, and um, mirror imagings that are happening. Maybe you can talk just a little bit now that we're on the subject. I was going to kind of wait till later to talk about it, but I'm glad that we're addressing it now. Just like w what is the controversy about? Um, um, I, I, I've right. read the newspaper articles about it, right. um, and it, it just doesn't. It, 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 it doesn't, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Right. It doesn't make sense. I'll, I'll do my best to answer that. So I'm not at liberty to say more than the statement yeah. about why I parted ways, and they parted ways with me, with my publisher, Houghton Mifflin. Um, but I have learned a lot. Well, first I should say in a sentence what this book is about, so you know what I'm about to say. Oh, you can't say it in a sentence. You'll okay. It's so, well, there's it's so, so much more there. So much more. Let's hear the sentence okay. anyway. So <laughs> you should know that this is a book about a, 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 a forgotten hero of everyone's history, but certainly LGBTQ history, which I believe is everyone's history. Um, and his name is John Addington Simmons, and he was born in 1840. He died young. Uh, but he had the misfortune to be born in Britain in a time when um, sodomy was a capital offense and when censorship laws had been basically in invented when he was 17 uh, in Britain, kind of the first time a secular government learned how to censor speech in a secular context. And so the combination of multiplying, metastasizing homophobic law, which continued throughout his lifetime in Britain, and influenced other nations. And the metastasizing and expansion of laws against speech, which uh, the dean referred to, um, which led to the arrests of booksellers, suppression of print runs, confiscation of destruction of printing presses, a whole history that's well, not well known. Well, false science about like examining people after, you know, who are criminally accused of, uh, of sodomy. It, and this is also uh -huh. very shocking. Um, th there were even, in the 1870s, the growth of an a, a kind of subsection of medicine in which in criminal trials of men convicted of same-sex sodomitical offenses, these venereologists would actually examine the bodies like a witch hunt of the men accused of sodomitical offenses. And there was this mythological kind of medical claim that you could tell who had committed a sodomitical offense by, I won't get too graphic, but you know, by marks, by, 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 by things on their physical body, exams, physical exams, exactly. which are really a form of torture and are still practiced in homophobic countries to this day that inherit British colonial law. But the, the, the sort of big picture is these laws proliferated as this beautiful young man who just was a great romantic and, a, and wanted to write poetry, wanted to write about love, wanted to write about the body and about God, right? Um, and his sense of the divinity in all things. He was coming of age as these laws were cracking down on, on, on men who loved men. And I fell in love with John Addington Simmons uh, when my thesis advisor at Oxford gave me a collection of his letters. And I was, at that time, the mother of a teenage boy. And the, the letters start in the voice of a teenage boy finding out, you know, awakening yeah. to himself and right. finding out that he, he, he's fallen in love with this other young, young man. And, my, as my mother's heart just went out to him because I knew what was right. ahead, you know, and I imagined my own son, you know, in this position of, of, of knowing his love would be shattered with a fear of prison and execution and, and all of these things. So to fast forward, the book is both about how he came of age and then tried in various extraordinary ways to tell the truth about love between men at a time when that became more and more illegal. So he would try an allegory, or he would write historical uh, biographies about men who loved men, like Michelangelo Buonarotti, 
or he would write poems originally with the correct pronouns and then change the pronouns for publication. And he did things like even embed codes. And I don't want to give away the end of the book, but it's also a a literary detective novel because he embedded codes in his poems that the present could not decipher about same-sex love. His present. Exactly. But that he knew that in the future, he believed he would have readers, he would have you guys sitting in this room and Malcolm willing to convene this discussion um, and that we could put these... uh, pieces of the puzzle together, and he, he left it so that a great love story could be told sometime in the future. And what's lovely is his persistence. I mean, it's like he just, he gets shut down, and he just will not stop. He will not stop. And, and that's the difference. I can imagine there being scores of other people who wrote these things, but he was the one person who couldn't stop doing it, you know, and, exactly. and it's just, his persistence is just, and, and you're right, there's like, his, his personality comes out in the letters that you excerpt, it's just, you know, he, he, you know, he's trying to help other people too, he knows yeah. that he's not the only one, and he's, he's trying to help other people, I wonder, as you wrote it, you met, mentioned it just very in passing, just writing about this as a heterosexual woman, um, just like, how, how your perspective on things may have kind of opened up certain ways of seeing this that are, that are different than, say, a, 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 um, a, a gay man who was doing this historical research with? Um, yeah, that's a, an interesting question. I, you know, I've never called myself a heterosexual woman. Yeah, I guess that's <laughs> right. I didn't mean to you know, put okay. that on you or anything. <laughs> that's okay, but I kind of want to speak to that because yeah. we're in a time when it, I, I always thought the book was just about him and that, you know, I should really clear myself oh, out of funny. the text. Yeah. Um, but this question has come up, and it's a legitimate one in a time when people want to understand what's an author's motivation. Right. So um, I've, you know, in the book I say I'm identified as a heterosexual woman because I'm married to a man, right, and I've been right. married to another man, and I have two children, yeah, yeah. two stepchildren with these That's men. That's how I should have said it. Sorry about That's that. That's no, but <laughs> I mean, how would you know? You have not followed everything I've ever written about, you know, my sexual history. <laughs> but, um, but I guess what I just want to say is that now there's a there's a term that didn't used to exist in most of my writing life, which is fluid. Yeah. And I personally think most, you know, uh, that's how I would identify myself. Right, right. Um, now my yeah, kids on, are adults and the they continuum. won't be too embarrassed by mom talking about her sex life again. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but, but uh, I, that's not the most important thing to me about his story. What, although certainly I think selfishly, you know, if God forbid I broke up with my husband or I, you know, he passed away or whatever, my mother who's a widow or my, you know, kids, I would not want half the world to be closed off to any of us right. for true love. Yeah. You know, if, if, if. Yeah, for me, I yeah. felt like it, it, it gave a kind of, I mean, if it's, it, it doesn't seem as self-interested as, you know, if I wrote a book about something that was just about me, it, when you writing and showing interest in it shows that it is something of universal interest. And, and that's exactly when you said you fell in love with John Addington Simmons. I'm like, I totally fell in love with him. I mean, right, that, right? Sense of, that, that, that sensitivity and that persistence and that desire to help other people. I mean, he's, an, he's a very admirable person, even just you know, trying to make the most the mistakes that he'd made in his life, and you know, it, it's very true. But uh, can I just? I, I just have so much to say. Yeah, about I know completely. In this but you know, also the other reason he drew me so much for this story about, as you say, his insistence on as it got really more and more dangerous. Like people were, his friends were being arrested, their careers were being yeah. destroyed. You know. Uh, Things, you know, booksellers were being arrested and spending two to four months at hard labor. I mean, he was seeing this happen all around him. His career was being derailed over and over. His letters were being passed on to the fellows at Modeling College Uh, when he was trying to get an academic career. Just one kind of derailment and catastrophe after another based on his sexuality. And also, you've got to bear in mind that at this time, most gay men, men we today call gay, which was a term that didn't exist then, you know, married women and had children because there was no other path. And so at this point, he was married to an extraordinary woman. They had a very unusual relationship. I mean, he seemed to have been accepted and loved by his whole family, even though there was part of their life they they would never share. Um, He had four daughters. They loved him. They championed his voice as a writer about same-sex love after he had passed, or at least one of them did. And... um, so this extraordinary man, you know, the the value of the love that he's describing, I also just wanted to sh- 
finally share, you know, why else it really mattered to me to, to tell this story. We tend in a post-sexological age to think about sexual identity just in the context of sexuality, right? Right, right. But that's an innovation. Yeah, that's true. And, it, and this book kind of tells how that came to be. At the end of his life, Simmons wrote the first, uh, really the first gay rights manifesto in English, yeah. a proper problem in modern ethics, and that kind of evolved into sexual inversion, which became this widespread movement called sexology, which we inherit, that, which is how we see the world now, which looks at sexual variation as a natural continuum. But it's focused on what people do in bed. Right, right. Um, but his, his life and Whitman's too, and, and Whitman was a great interlocutor with him, they had a, a love affair kind of, though they never met through letters over the course of decades, what motivated him most was not specifically to tell the truth just about what people did together in bed. He really wanted to write about love. And I guess I also have to share, in addition to saying, you know, it's not that simple, what is, what is heterosexuality, you know, et cetera, two gay male couples saved my family's life mm -hmm. when I was a single mother emotionally, yeah. and I could go into depth, you know, depth about that, but I've seen in my own life how the love between these four men sheltered my little family yeah, at a yeah. time when, you know, as a single mother of two small children, you know, it, it's a very tiny boat in a very big sea yeah, to, to be responsible for two little beings. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, a big part of my own life as a mother is that my kids grew up under the shelter of these two couples. You know, I, they didn't, it wasn't a commune, but they were like role modeling how to be good people to my children and creating stability <clears throat> in their lives and a sense of extended family. And if they didn't have their love between themselves, which I saw in my own lifetime, went from dangerous and career destroying right, exactly. to one couple's married, you know, like yeah. accepted, settled, uh, accepted by our own society. If they hadn't had each other, my children wouldn't have had them and that kind of sense that we were not so fragile and we would be safe. Yeah, I, I think about that a lot, the dis, dis, like the distance between us and the 19th century people. Do you know because I mean? even, um, you know, I, I, I um, wrote a dissertation on Henry David Thoreau and, you know, just reading the, the letters that people sent to each other and just the way they interacted was just so much more um, affectionate, uh, so much more um, loving, effusive, mm. uh, um, you know, less buttoned up, less distance from each other. Yeah. And, and you're right, I mean, that's probably partly a, a function of just not having everything being about sex acts, but um, just how people relate with each other. And, and I think that's you know, part of what I loved about John Addington Simmons is just he cared so much about that part of just like, how do we treat each other? Yeah, it's true. And uh, can I expand yeah. on what you just said, uh, Malcolm? Because it's so, so interesting. I mean, again, this book is like... Uh, it, men who identify as heterosexual have gotten so much from reading yeah. about how about this book because ways that straight men have had to suppress exactly. affection, yeah. e emotional attachment for other men, touching other men, as well as a whole range of human reactions and experiences, dates from this period right, when right. the idea was kind of invented that um, these behaviors were you know, not manly. Right, and, and it was right. a whole range of things. Well, it, I just think of visiting right? my friend in Africa. We, we hold hands when we're walking and talking. It was like, I'm, it's a way of getting my attention. I'm, you're literally listening to me on this right. part of the story. Wow. And, and, and you're right. I mean, I, like, it's just like behavior that we, that's gone. And, and it's totally the way Walt Whitman related to the world, is the way Henry David Thoreau did. It's why Henry Thoreau and Emerson, you know, there's so much tension in the relationship. It was just like, how do you navigate? How like, affectionate are we? How much do we care for each other? Absolutely, and what Malcolm is describing is this section of the book where I talk about what a vast range of, not just for men with men, but women with women, a vast range of physical intimacy and emotional intimacy people used to have before this rigid binary got constructed legally, especially in the 1860s and 1870s. And you see it, you know, Abraham Lincoln, which... I mean, this right, is a book right. that talks that. about Abraham Lincoln sleeping in bed yeah. with, you know, a man for whom he loved very deeply and it was a primary relationship. Uh, I, I, I speculate about whether 
you know, there are many things that are controversial, I suppose, in this book, and I don't know of another detailed ex exploration. I know Larry Kramer even fictionalized well, Moby that Dick, guy. I mean, so, yeah. so, I mean, the, the narrator in Moby Dick is sleeping in another bed with another man, and there's all these, like, very sexual innuendo throughout the book. I mean, um, so, I mean, it, 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 that's another thing, too, to think of, to, leaves of grass could come out into the world, and then, and then actually people are trying to put it back in the closet again. Exactly. That's what was... Well, and, and I want to chime in that, so in America, there were not, when, when Whitman wrote Leaves of Grass in 1855, there weren't laws against m a lot of sexual acts that men could do with men. There weren't, they were not illegal. Um, and there was no federal law about what we would call homosexual acts at all. So the things that Whitman describes pretty clearly, fellatio, um, you know, mutual masturbation, just all kinds of intimacy, and he, he's very clear saying, my comrade, the man who loves me, the man who's, whose hand I hold, we, we lovers together, Super clear, and, and by the way, the Whitman you read in college or high school is not the very graphic, original, uncensored Whitman who is in these pages. Um, that was just life, right? Yeah. It was just life. Men hugged each other, like Whitman describes these men at the about to set sail, one of them's about to take a journey on a ship, and they're parting, and one is, you know, falling onto the breast of the other man, the other man is holding him, and it's just a public scene that's totally commonplace. Um, and the same thing where he describes, and I talk about this at the end of the book, you know, himself the narrator with his lover sitting quietly in a city park holding hands, just being totally satisfied. And you think of that as a, as a scene from like the last five or 10 years, right, but right. it was before homophobic, modern homophobic law and discourse was codified, right? I mean, there have been laws against sodomy since 1533 in Britain. But at the time that Whitman wrote, as you say, men could love each other, right? Yeah. With so much of freedom because the state hadn't gotten around to criminalizing so much that we now see as criminal. And so going over to Britain, Leaves of Grass was a revelation to Simmons when he read it as a tormented, what we would say gay man in his 20s, he was 26 years old when a friend of his at Cambridge handed him Leaves of Grass. Because at this point it was being handed around like, like you know, a, 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 a forbidden text right, or a... Exactly. a, a, a you know, some secret thing. It was illegal to import Leaves of Grass after 1857 in Britain because of the Obscene Publications Act. So, you know, when you said, uh, someone else who loves Whitman, we're echoing kind of an underground from the 1850s and 1860s in Britain when people were literally handing smuggled copies of Leaves of Grass or pirated copies to one another. And they couldn't even say, I love Walt Whitman, look at the Calamus poems. They would say things like, I'm an admirer of Whitman. And that was code for <laughs> right. maybe I love men too. Yeah. Or even, you know, feminists loved him. Like everyone who wanted a freer world in, in Britain resonated to this illicit Whitman uh, because he, he, he saw the world of today. Um, so that's just a way of validating, you know, what a, what a breath uh, of fresh well, air it exactly. was. Exactly, and, and um, how hard it would be to, to have it be gone again. Exactly. Um, you know, the, um, one of the interesting things for me is I, I, I look at our church, and I think, I think the reason why we're making more progress on LGBTQ plus issues is because we started ordaining women. I, that's so I, I, I just don't think that we would have gone as far as we did if, if women weren't part of the culture, if we still had that kind of male-dominated culture in the clergy. Um, and so, so in my experience, in my lifetime, feminism has is, is kind of accelerated the, the realization of LGBTQ plus rights. Um, That's but interesting. In the 19th century, um, you talk a little bit about, it's, it's like a little bit more convoluted, the relation between feminism and you know, what was happening to, to gay people. And I wonder if you right. can talk about that a little bit, because sure. um, I thought it was an interesting element, even though it wasn't a major part of the... It, it's very interesting, Malcolm, that you um, describe the evolution in your, um, in your denomination yeah. that way. Would it not also be the case that the LGBTQ movement supported the ordination of yeah, women? Yeah, I would totally think so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so in the in, in the late late nineteen sixties, we had um, a, a young man who basically got up into the pulpit. He was supposed to read the second letter of the Corinthians, and he said he read a statement about how important it was to love and affirm gay people. And it was a very powerful wow. moment in our church life. And you're right; it certainly was part of that 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 culture that brought into being um, women's ordination. 
I have to say, I have never had a moment like Friday night here oh, at gosh, Grace Cathedral yeah. when um, a Jewish guy right. uh, <laughs> with a beautiful voice sang all of the Calamus poems, which are these highly erotic and loving and tender poems that, um, that Simmons was obsessed yeah. by, sang it all the way through in the heart of the cathedral, right? And at the very end, the singer started crying. I started crying. You could feel, I could swear, the spirit of Walt Whitman yeah. at the very end, like blessing us. But to me, as a, as a Jewish woman, as a Whitman admirer, as, as someone who, you know, admires Rabbi Jesus's right. radical <laughs> example, to have those words about same-sex love and the body spoken out loud yeah. in the heart of a cathedral. It's such a transformational thing to, to model. Right, but and I mean, it liberates our understanding of scripture too, because scripture is, doesn't carry those same you know, post 19th century assumptions about sex and how men and women interact or any of that. It's, it, it's, we Absolutely. read so much of, well, we can't help but read our own experience back into those formational texts. But yeah, feminism in, in the 19th century and its relation I, to this. I should, because yeah. I could go on forever about. I know, I figured you're like, you're probably one of the best people I can think of to ask. No, I promise I'll address <laughs> it. But I, I just, I do need to say, since you bring up the, the point about religion and, and, and kind of blessing same-sex love within yeah. a religious context. Um, a reason that Simmons, who was deeply religious, and his father was deeply, deeply religious, and this was a source of great torment for Simmons, right? Because he felt like he, what he called the wolf, same-sex desire, uh. was base and at, at odds with his divine soul. Um, when he read Whitman, he felt, I think, this unifying blessing to integrate his body and his spiritual life, life his physical life, his love life, his spiritual life, because Whitman's view of the divine is so holistic and accepting. And I just wanted to share that yeah. because I think, I personally think that's what God meant. <laughs> um, but yeah. it, before Whitman, someone in Simmons' world would have never, ever, ever heard a, a blessing of the body that, and a blessing of the natural Sing world. body electric, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So feminism, yes. So I think that we're right, and, and this again is one of those things that has made the book controversial because we live in such a, a divided era where if you're a feminist, you're just supposed to be a feminist. And if you care about queer history, you have to just care about queer history. Um, and these are really, uh, in my view, artificial and destructive um, and recent ri rigidifications of this quest we should all be on to understand ourselves and each other and the world around us. And w what I mean is, just as your story about um, the LGBTQ movement supporting women's ordination and women's ordination bringing in some fresh air for supporting same-sex love in your church, which I totally see and agree with from yeah. my observation, um, the same threads were there in the 19th century with feminism and gay men, and or what we would today call gay men. Um, and it's really important to understand them. One reason I love being from San Francisco is that it would have never occurred to me that it's not important to write about love between men. And what's really weird for me, uh, being outside of San Francisco, is people ask questions like, well, you're a feminist, why do you, <laughs> why is this an important subject for you? So basically, in the 19th century, the British state experimented with controlling the bodies of women in a way that led to the first organized feminist uprising. What the British state was doing in the 1860s is that, um, and I think that a lot, my theory in this book, as in many of my books, is that a lot of this was about innovating methods of social control at a time when people were being empowered in new ways, right? Literacy, um, childhood education, uh, laws protecting workers, you know, early forms of unionization, the Chartist movement, the example of the French Revolution. Uh, the elites in Britain were being destabilized, right? The um, Indian uprising overseas in 1857, there was a lot of clamoring for uh, equality and, and equal rights. And women were, the first generation of like middle-class literate women were coming of age, and that is very destabilizing if you've been keeping everyone under wraps. So, in the face of all this movement, the British state really used sexuality to, and, and speech laws to uh, 
invent new ways to control populations that are so effective that we take them for granted now as what a state does. Yeah. We barely question them, but they were inventions. So we no longer ask what right does the state have to monitor speech at all. I mean, vestigially in America we do because of the First Amendment, but in Britain they've stopped even asking that question, the state monitors speech. Um, but that was invented in the 19th century as a secular task for the state. We no longer ask what role, you know, why should the state have anything to say abor ad, about abortion at all, right? It's a totally, it's not the state's business. Uh, we, we tend to say, well, is it this month or that month that the state will say it's okay for me to do mm -hmm. this with my body? So, but the state getting so inside your body, right? And, and I would say uh, the AIDS crisis is another great example right, of the exactly. state deciding, you know, what should be done with people or who should live and who should die and so on. These, these ways of getting inside your private home, inside your body, looking at who you're sleeping with in your bed, right? The whole discussion right now about trans rights in Britain, which is appalling, which we don't have, even have to detour to that, but the whole question that the state has any, any right to look into your bedroom at all, that was invented. Okay, God used to have the right to look into your bedroom according to various religions, but the secular state never had, never even, claimed that right, let alone the other rights I'm talking about to monitor speech and so on, till the 1850s. So where I'm going with that is in the 1860s, they started to pass laws called the Contagious Diseases Acts to arrest women who in um, port towns in Britain whom they saw as possibly looking like sex workers because of worries about venereal disease among the military. But you know what happens when the state decides that it gets to right. say who's who looks like a whore, right? They started to you know, give uh, police officers powers to arrest any woman who was dressed too provocatively or looked like she was having too much fun or was out late with a male companion or even her brother um, or relative. And so women were being arrested without charge or trial, held for up to nine months in what were called lock hospitals and forcibly treated against their will with horrific mercury rubs that oh, made gosh, them yeah. very sick and poisoned them and sometimes killed them. Um, of course, their livelihood was ruined. Many of them had children who were you know, left with no one to care for them. It, it was catastrophic. And so Josephine Butler, one of the very first feminists, organized the first feminist campaign against the Contagious Diseases Act. And there were also forced vaginal exams, mm -hmm. right? Um, brutal, violent, and sanitary. S but, and that was one of the first feminist triumphs. It actually succeeded after years and years of acts after acts, finally they were repealed. However, the British state saw how effective it was to say, I'm gonna claim your body, I'm gonna look inside your body, I'm gonna say that these acts are illegal, and I'm gonna give the state powers to um, monitor who you're with and punish whom you love. And so my theory is that it didn't really have anything to do with homophobia. It had to do with social control. Uh, that the state figured out a way to use gay men, basically, what we would today call gay men, as um, exemplars of what the state can do to you and how far its power can go. And, you know, it was very serious. And, and one of the controversies, you asked about the controversy, one of the controversies oh, is just how severe was the state's persecution of gay men. And I can't speculate directly about all the reasons there may have been such a controversy about this book, which everyone who's read it says, I don't get it, this book is a love story. But I can tell you that since I've been on the road with this book and more and more scholarship has emerged about this issue, because a lot of historians are looking at this question now, there is a concentrated whitewashing in the media right now of how severe the persecution of gay men was in the 19th century a concentrated whitewashing of established um, documentation of, of executions, so, and, and worse, of arrests, uh, you know, very widespread arrests. So the controversy in, in my case is that, and I wanna tell you transparently in case you buy this book, on page 71 and 72, I got two cases wrong. I thought two people were executed. Uh, research has later emerged I was wrong, they were not executed, they were sentenced to hard labor. Um, 
However, in my book tour, I said that 55, the dozens of men had been executed in the 19th century. This was misquoted as dozens of men had been executed in the Victorian period, which I didn't say. But then there was a huge global viral um, wrong yeah. report what? What? that I had said what? that dozens of men had been executed and they hadn't. Well. That is not true. In fact, the parliamentary papers, H.G. Cox, Nameless Offenses, Charles Upchurch, um, uh, Graham Robb, the most respected historians of this period, confirm clearly 55 men were executed before 1835 in Britain for sodomitical offenses. And if anything, H.G. Cox, who's one of my readers for the next edition, says, I've under-reported the persecution of gay men in the 19th century. There were eight thousand arrests in the 19th century for sodomitical offenses in it you know that range yeah. well, because the rules changed the about what 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 counted as a, a sodomitical offense yes. why is why so why are people so like what, what what is the energy behind this like you know what is it about our cultural moment i mean if you'd written this three years ago do you think we'd have the same response i mean like what's going on like I, I, it's hard i mean maybe it's not fair to ask you because no, you're like it's at the fair very center, i mean it's it's definitely been probably you know the most famous thing about this book is this argument i over, know i just you know, <laughs> sorry how many about people that. died no yeah. you, it's look i mean i can't complain look at what happened i mean i'm no walt whitman but yeah. you know books have been right, very exactly. badly misrepresented in right. the past um, I can't, you know, I'm writing an essay right now to try to answer that I was question. wondering, I was thinking that's almost like the next book. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, the outrage over outrages. Yeah. But I think there are a few things at play. Um, and these are purely speculative. Yeah. One of them is that history is being digitized right now. And the digitization of history allows states to kind of decide w what... Uh, homogenize history and decide what history goes forward into the future. And without even a negative intention, I'm seeing that a lot of persecution of gay men in the 19th century is being erased by the digitization of history. And there's um, a huge deal that was done with, in the Obama administration for Britain and America with gigantic entities um, like, you know, textbook manufacturers to digitize their history jointly. Uh, so a lot of money has gone into this. Yeah. And I do know that the proceedings of the Old Bailey, which are a digitized government funded version of 19th century um, prosecutions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the historians overseeing it are very nice. I met with them. They've been very helpful. But it's a big government funded effort. And the fact is, when I first did my research with the proceedings, I got, qu I got dozens of sentences for various sodomitical offenses. Now you get about 14 um, executions, right? Oh, and, and, and many narrower uh, range of sentences. Is it someone doing something wrong? I'm not gonna say that, but I can tell you running a digital search engine myself, Daily Clout, the way you, search is not a neutral thing, right? The way you set up search determines the results. So if you leave out buggery but include sodomy, you, someone searching won't know that there should be 44 right, cases, right. but there are only 14 coming up. So, you know, if a book comes out that has a version of history that's thoroughly documented, that's at odds with something that the governments have already invested tons and, you know, like millions and millions of dollars in, maybe that's a reason not to say, you know, to, to highlight any possible flaws yeah. or distort even um, what the book says. Um, but also there are other things that may be at play. These are purely speculative. Britain is in the middle of a, a Brexit fight right now, right? Very huge argument about whether Britain should leave the EU or not. One of the reasons people don't want to leave the EU if they don't is human rights law, which protects everyone. Um, my book basically shows very thoroughly, and it's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of <laughs> footnotes, you know, uh. whether, you know, granted I got two cases wrong, and there are two other errors I'll identify that didn't, weren't caught in copy editing, um, a name and a date later on. But n nonetheless, my book thoroughly documents that the British state can make a horrible, horrible mistakes, you know, fatal mistakes. So at a time when the conservatives are in charge of Britain and in charge of 
the BBC, where the first airing of this erroneous interview that yeah, went so viral right. oh emerged. I'm not saying there's a conspiracy, but I can see that a book that says the British state has a history, not just of suppressing and torturing brown people around the world, which we all know, but experimenting on its own citizens with fatal repressive law. That is, you know, as a former political consultant, I can see that it's worth a little bit of effort to take yeah. that chick off the chessboard, you know? <laughs> Get rid of that book <laughs> right now, that's not helpful. Yeah. Apart from that, I, I really can't speculate, except that um, I do see that in both Britain and America right now, the right wing, and they're the same advisors, right? Yeah. The same political advisors now, it's, it's global, right? Trump's guy is advising uh, Boris Johnson's guy, and you know Putin's a friend. And there are these new alliances yeah. that are that are very scary of oligarchs, basically, and, and right wingers, highly funded, in in many countries around the world with these right wing advisors. LGBTQ rights is being um, highlighted and. Queer people are being demonized as a way to solidify the base, as a way to splinter the left. Right, right. Um, and so that is what I see as yeah, well. I mean, and as you say, I mean, the book, to me, it, 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 those are, it, that's an element of the book, is just reporting on, on you know, what the criminal effects of these laws were. I mean, but the, the vast majority of it, it's like the story of Oscar Wilde. It's just to be reminded of just like, here's this person who was like confident in who he was, and, and he was just completely demeaned and, and ruined by you know the by the right. by the, the, the these trials exactly and and I want to add to that I mean I did you know you asked did you think that this book would be so controversial when I found the work of Cox and Rob and Upchurch which is not well known outside of queer yeah. history that documents how brutally queer oh, yeah, people were right. treated in the decades before Oscar Wilde, yeah. I did know it would be controversial because that's not the narrative we have about history. Yeah. Uh, even well-educated people are taught that the Oscar Wilde trial, where he got two years at hard labor, was the high point of persecution of gay men and kind of a, a, a beginning. Right, in right. fact, that law, the La Boucher Amendment, was a reform. The sentences that I found that and, and that were part. so smeared when I found them and tried to talk about them um, were for 10 years, 15 years, lifetimes at hard labor, in addition to executions, in the decades before Oscar Wilde was sentenced. So it is this evidence, and it's not my work, it's right. these, these other uh, LGBTQ scholars counting every single conviction. It really has been suppressed, I think, in the common narrative about um, what happened to gay men in the 19th century. Yeah. So I, I did know that that would be controversial. We have a tradition here of t um, taking questions on yeah. note cards. So um, you're welcome to ask a question um, for Naomi. And I, um, I, um, I was thinking, I, I, usually I, I'd like to know more about, like, I mean, we've studied so carefully, you know, your life and, and working on this project. But, uh, you know, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about just, like, the young version of you, like, when you first, <laughs> like, decided to be a writer, like, how that was. Oh, thank you very much. Um, you, you know, how did you decide to that this was going to be your world. That, I mean, when you were a kid growing up in San Francisco, um, you probably were aware of Lawrence Ferengeli and City Lights Bookstore and Howell. I mean, it, but, but what were you like then? Did, did you read those works and think, I want to, this is going to be my life? You know, Malcolm, this is such a great question because I think my, my whole life really, I do owe it to San Francisco and to institutions in Here, San Francisco yeah, like yeah. this one. Um, my dad was a writer, and he was of that generation of Ferlinghetti, and he knew um, Ginsburg, and he was, a, you know, a raffish yeah, bohemian yeah. Uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, so I knew that that could be done, and also I knew that you, what it was like to be a working writer, because my dad was typing away on his typewriter every night, so I knew you could um, make a living, right, you know, even right. if not a great one, just typing. So that was cool. <laughs> Uh, no, I agree. I mean, I, I'm so grateful that my, my grandfather is an Episcopal priest, and it just made that a possibility. Like, I, I would never have thought of being an Episcopal priest. If, in your father, the fact that he did that, you could yeah. see an example of, oh, this is what it's like. Absolutely. But I also thought the world was like San Francisco. Yeah. And I was also growing up, <laughs> I was also growing up at a time, I grew up in the hate, right? So I, th that was, I thought the world was like the hate. <laughs> and, and the Castro. And I grew up at the height of the... Um, LGBTQ yeah. movement right. and so, and Harvey Milk right. and you know and so what I saw and, and I really owe my feminism to the LGBTQ movement to that example uh, another one of those connections because 
I saw, first of all, I was so moved as a teenager by a radical social justice movement based on love, like that quote from the 70s, an army of lovers cannot fail. I mean, that's a beautiful world, right? That's what's more inspiring to a teenager who wants to change the world. And also, I really saw how in San Francisco, it's a really thriving democracy. You know, at least it was in the 70s when I was growing up at going to Lowell, because I saw that, you know, immigrants from China who were very poor uh, were sending their kids to, to, to you know, to Lowell, and they were going, to, going on to Berkeley. And um, so in one generation, yeah. there was this incredible movement, and they were organizing as a big voting block in San Francisco, even though they were not wealthy. I saw that you know, gay and lesbian people and trans people were organizing as a powerful voting block, even though they were a little minority. And so you know, my whole career has also been about citizen grassroots organizing and democracy, I really saw such a, an inspiring example of people organizing and you know, getting Harvey Milk onto, oh, yeah. into a position of leadership, you know, that you could bring your values into civic life. Um, so then when I left San Francisco, and I'd never experienced sexism here ever, 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 I never experienced the marginal, marginalization of people for their sexuality. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, everyone in my high school pretended to be bisexual even if they weren't, because right, right. it was too boring otherwise, right. you know. And, um, and, and then I got to, to Yale and to the East Coast, and it was like going back 150 years in time. <laughs> and, and so every time people say, oh, you're so controversial, I'm so, puzzled because in San Francisco, nothing I have to say is controversial. It's so ordinary. Um, and I guess I became a, a kind of feminist writer because I thought that San Francisco really worked beautifully as the kingdom of heaven in yeah, a lot of right, ways, right. voice of the voiceless, and, and love was safe here, and, you know, largely. I mean, yeah. it's not perfect, but it was pretty perfect compared to everywhere else. And then the rest of the world is such a shock compared with growing up in San Francisco in the 70s. I want the rest of the world to have these values. So that's the Yeah, I, 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 I had a chance to go um, to revisit the beauty myth um, and was thinking a lot about just um, trying to describe that to our, our daughter is away at college. And I'm um, trying to talk to her and describe to her about that. It's like, what happens when these other um, restrictions on women are lifted, and then you have this deep internalized restriction of just like, you know, what it means to be beautiful. Yeah. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what the beauty myth was when you first conceived of it, and then just like, kind of, I mean, it's like all these years later, what, you know, what's happened with the beauty myth? Uh, you know, how much of a power does it still have on us? We've been able to name it, but sometimes naming it isn't enough. Um. Another great question. Man, I wish I could just be in dialogue here all the time. I know, That's I keep so thinking of that too. It's so good. <laughs> um, anytime you want me to come back, oh, I'll great. come back. It's beautiful. Uh, so I wrote The Beauty Myth when I was a baby feminist. I was like 24, 25 when I was yeah. writing it. And I was a graduate student. And I wrote it because um, I went to Yale as an undergraduate. And I saw that this generation of women who should have been like the feistiest and most combative and most uh, politically scary, <laughs> in a good way, generation of, of young women ever to walk the earth, because we inherited the gains oh, of yeah, second wave right, feminism, completely. overwhelmingly, uh, the women around me, and I'd, been, I'd had anorexia myself as a young teenager, um, overwhelmingly we had, we were, you know, very preoccupied with what we were putting in our bodies or what we weighed on the scale or, you know, exercise fixations, women running around the track over and over and over. And so I saw that this was occupying our minds in a way that um, neutered us politically, you know, made us less than, less of a threat to the existing order than we should be. So, you know, I, I studied the 19th century and I saw that every time there was a big push forward, uh, and this, of course, was also the the thesis of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. Every time there's a big push forward, women um, become literate. There's a big push backward with a, a beauty ideal or with an ideal of femininity that's rigid. Um, in, in the in the in the fifties and early sixties was the ideal of the perfect housewife. So I saw that this had just revamped itself. You know, the thinness of the ideal and the youth of the ideal and the artificialness and the airbrushedness of the ideal, um, which was so unattainable, 
was a way to keep us off balance uh, at a time when women should have been much, you know, so, so politically threatening. So that's why I wrote yeah. that book. And then and what about just how things have changed since then, too? I, I, um, I, I love, too, there's like a little section in there that you probably don't remember because it's, you know, old news for you. But it, it said it was about saying, you know, if you're, if you're putting up on makeup because you just love makeup, that's one thing. But if you're like feel this compulsion to always be looking good, then that's, that's, a, that's a damaging thing. And I, I wonder if that, how much that compulsion is with us it, more so, less. I guess that part of it's the technology's change, hasn't it? In terms of just like social media means that there are a lot more images of us that are constantly we're broadcasting out to that world, and and maybe that's amplified the beauty myth and dynamic. Yeah, I mean, some things have gotten much better, and some things have gotten much yeah. worse. And it's it's a question that people ask me a lot, understandably, because the beauty myth is like I don't know, twenty five or thirty years old, um, and so here's what's changed that's much better. It's much more commonly understood that there is a beauty myth right, and that right. we are allowed to critique it. Yeah. When I first started out, people were really enthralled to it, like how dare we even question, you know, we're def defective women if we question this quest or think it could be otherwise. Um, I think the body positivity movement has been incredibly important. And Instagram and social media cuts both ways. A lot of young women feel like I have to be perfect all the time but it you know instagram also shows us such a broad range of people being kind of displaying themselves and being proud of themselves and such variation uh it kind of has broken apart the stranglehold of like vogue and cosmo which were the gatekeepers oh, yeah. when i was growing up Pornography has changed the beauty myth a lot i mean you used to have to really hunt out pornography when i was growing up you know get a physical copy of playboy or penthouse uh, now, of course, it's on everyone's phone from their earliest childhood, practically. And so kids are growing up at a, in a very scary way, seeing sex as what they see on porn sites. And, and I wrote in Vagina about how dangerous that is to our, literally to our brains, and especially, no disrespect, to the male brain, because um, the, the circuitry that gives you a boost of dopamine when you look at porn and mas can I talk about this yeah, and masturbate yeah. uh, it it desensitizes you very quickly over time so you need more and more extreme images you become addicted effectively to get that same level of arousal so that's affected people in terms of the beauty myth because I think people are very they can't separate often their sexual value from whether they look hot right looking hot is very much um, tied with am I sexually valuable um, but you know, other things are much better. I, I do want to say one thing too about the the influence of queer culture on me and the beauty myth. Yeah. Um, and I've never really talked about this before, but it was so formative. When I was growing up, up in San Francisco, like I brought my kids to visit San Francisco recently, and they were still young. You know, one was a teenager, one was a young adult, and we <laughs> walked onto the Castro, and there was a beautiful man. He was like six foot two totally naked, uh, right. right? You know, I think covered in like some glitter. beautiful glitter, yeah. <laughs> wearing, um, you know this guy? <laughs> like wearing uh, like cowboy boots and a cowboy hat and he was just lounging in the sun. And I thought, you know, I'm home. <laughs> 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 and, it was, and it was a little shocking, I think, for my children at first, but I was so happy that they were seeing like a range of human self-acceptance, right, you know? Right. And uh, I grew up, in a cast, you're like, you know, in Halloween, every, there was every, and I owe it this to, to trans women too, yeah. and, and to um, transvestites at that time, everyone was wearing a costume, and everyone was proclaiming with their bodies, I am valuable, my sexuality is valuable, my body is valuable, and they looked like all kinds of things, right? And that was paradise, I mean, it really was. And so I, I thought, well, maybe we could apply that to women, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Um, that was very influential to me. Um, here's um, here's a question, Naomi. As ever, thank you. Um, your vital, brilliant for your vital, brilliant spirit, your mind so generously expressed. In this time of acute peril in our nation, what individual acts can you imagine that we may do in direct action for common good? Oh, what a beautiful question! I know. I'm going to let you take that home with you. That is really special. <laughs> thank you. 
Hopefully um, they didn't put their email in the back because they might want to get in touch with us. Okay, go. Um, wow, for common You're feeling good. down. Just take that out of yeah, you. Yeah, no, that's, that's, <laughs> going, that's going up on my pinned uh, above my desk. Um, that is such a good question. And, and uh, you know, uh, this is why we need fellowship like this yeah, and, and communities like this. Because uh, like you, I often feel alone. Or maybe you don't feel alone because you've got the grace community. But I feel alone at times because look at what's happening in the world. It seems so overwhelming. And it seems, and social media amplifies this, that the news of people who don't share our values uh, so far overwhelm, you know, these points of light of people who do share our values or institutions who do as importantly. I do believe from having studied democracies closing and then reopening in a book I wrote called The End of America, I do believe that we have to never lose hope. Uh, and the way we are most effective is through grassroots activism. And specifically, what I care about most is our knowing our rights in a democracy and understanding how democracy works. So one of the, the other project that I give most of my time to now is called Daily Clout. And I, I'm sharing this because you can use it for your own lobbying. Um, it's digitized democracy, so you can search any state or federal bill and share it through social media and mobilize your own networks to pass a bill or to criticize a bill or to block a bill. And this is a radical change because I can tell you as a political consultant, they don't want you to read the bills. They don't. Um, we also create blogs and videos that are easy to understand so that you know exactly what's in the tax bill or what's in the Green New Deal, and there's no smoke-filled rooms. So I encourage you to use that. And we, do, we also explain what is impeachment or what's a resolution, like all of these things in democracies around the world, because democracy is so powerful uh, a thing to give humans, right? Um, and, and if humans have real access to democracy, good policies evolve organically, right? So in democracies around the world, there's this push to make it look like a democracy, but really to totally obfuscate the act of engaging in it. In Britain, for instance, you can't even find the legislation. Like people are, I, I stymied people in, you know, at the, like members of parliament were debating Brexit, and I would say, well, I've heard all about Brexit for three years, where's the, where's the documentation uh, of what yeah. the deal looks like? Can I see the paperwork? And, and you know, people's jaws drop because no one shares that. Like, wh what? Where is the deal? Um, so, so use use. And if you don't use our platform, find out about your local laws. Find out about your, you know, who represents your neighborhood uh, at the city council level, really, or it's called something else in San yeah. Francisco. City council. City council. Right. And and at the state level, you can make huge change at a state level with just a few neighbors that you can't make at a federal level. So I really encourage you to do that. And finally, you know, your example is a lot more powerful than you think. We all, I mean, I'm very fortunate because I know that I have a platform and I know that I have listeners out there. But you may not know you have a platform and you have listeners out there. And social media is very empowering for this, too. Your role, you are a role model to so many people in your lives. You know, your, your relatives, your coworkers, your students, your, you know, if you're in the service industry, even people you serve, you know, you provide services to every day. And for you to be honest and, and express yourself and stand up for injustice, it, it makes such a difference. And, and find other people who will support you and liaise with you, it, it makes such a difference. Um, so those are not great specific things to share, but they're the most effective things that I've seen. Yeah, election day is coming up. Yeah. Um, so there's, we don't have enough time for the qu questions that are left, but the questions, just so that you know, are about the electability of um, Mayor Pete, um, the Kavanaugh nomination, how it um, affects our discussion about um, women's bodies and people's bodies in oh, general. Oh, wow, what a good question. Um, I know, it's a great question. And, um, and uh, political social progress that we've made since um, the Simmons time. And then uh, one question just about just like the, your editor's um, decisions to, to go different ways. But um, that's, what, that's what we would have been able to talk to if we stayed a little bit more. Do you, is there one of those questions that you want I mean, to speak I, of? I mean, I'd love to speak about the, ca the Kavanaugh yeah, question. Yeah, that sounds great. Important. That'd be perfect. What exactly was the question? Oh, here, I'll tell you exactly. You. Do you see how the Kavanaugh nomination for Supreme Court may, might allow... Um, 
uh, be in today's discussion about our bodies? Oh, so it's, that's it's, really some, good. Yeah. I, I, you know, I do. And something I didn't get a chance to say when we were talking about the beauty myth is the other side of the beauty myth, not just for women, but for everyone, about reclaiming the body, and that's our theme today, um, really has to do with talking about sexual violence and, and telling these stories that are so so suppressed and so painful. Um, I don't think the Kavanaugh hearings could have happened without a number of women, starting with Anita Hill, having come forward and gone through the excruciating process of telling the truth about the disgusting, unbelievable, brutal things that happen to women and to, to men, you know, every single day. And we're in a time, it's really interesting, I'd love the chance to talk about this from a theological perspective yeah. sometime, but we're in a time when all these secrets are emerging and these networks of abusers are being exposed. You know, the Ronan Farrow book, and um, you know, I have my own experience of having tried for now 20 years, since 2004, to amazing. hold Yale yeah. accountable for um, my own having been uh, your own experience. In my own experience yeah. at Yale as uh, being victimized. Um, so it, it doesn't get easier because institutions continue to punish and persecute women. And I really want to stress men too. Like 23% of women have been molested or abused sexually by the time they're 18. 17% of boys have as well. And something really to, to bear in mind, I know so many men for whom a, you know, assault or rape or molestation was a formative experience in their childhood. And they have even kind of less social validation for talking, unless it happens to have been a priest, you know. I right, mean, right. I mean, but like, even then it's not. I mean, even it's then it's hard, not. Yeah. yeah, it's a horrible thing for everybody. But I guess what I want to say is, you know, telling the tr these truths about violations of our body are so important to healing um, because women, I'll just speak about women, are made to feel like they're so weird and, and broken if it happened to them, you know, not just once but twice or if it happened to them at all or if they did anything, had a drink, went to that guy's house, whatever. So much guilt, so much of a sense of culpability. And that goes into eating disorders. It goes into punishing our bodies. It goes into blaming our bodies, um, not being willing to bless our bodies because yeah. our bodies betrayed us or brought this unwanted attention upon us or, or whatever it is or carry these secrets. So I firmly feel, so I'm just, you know, I've started to talk about this. I was raped as a child by a male babysitter, and um, which is one reason why getting, you know, abused by my professor 12 years later was so terrifying. Um, but the more, and I thought for years, I really shouldn't talk about this in public because it's, it's so upsetting, I don't want to be seen as a victim, it'll invalidate me, but we're in a time when, you know, I'm, I, I feel as a writer and as a woman, I didn't do anything wrong, you know? It's not my secret, it's, it's, it's not my secret. Um, and that the more I talk about it, A, it validates other people who are carrying around similar stories, and B, you know, I have felt that we heal more in our bodies when this poison is outside of us and we're not uh, accepting this wrong mandate from society to carry these secrets that do not belong to us. So I just want to, and, and I think, that, again, the fight for queer rights is so connected to this because these men were told there is something wrong with your body and your love and the things you do with your body that are so intimate and personal, the way you express your love. I mean... How damaging is that? And it's so on a spectrum of how women are shamed if they're, um, if they're body, you know, in their bodies in so many ways. For and so to end happily, Whitman said we should bless all of it, all of our bodies, all of our love, and reject people who try to damage us. And um, I, I thank Whitman, and I thank yeah. you, and I thank Grace Community for uh, being a place um, of such healing celebration of the body and the soul. Yeah, definitely. We're so grateful that you came in, as I said. Um, 
uh, let's see my final remarks. Um, what, <laughs> what, <laughs> please join me next week when our guest will be Alonzo King, the internationally celebrated choreographer and the cathedral's 2019 artist in residence. He'll be talking about how dance moves from idea to performance as he joins us during the rehearsals for the original work he's creating for us, which his company, Lines Ballet, will be performing here in February. Um, you're welcome to join us um, for the 11 o'clock service immediately after this. If you'd like to make a gift for the forum, we have the little glass box back there. And I'm just so glad that you came in. I'm so glad that we um, had this chance to, to talk today because I, I know I'm going to have a zillion other questions, but we'll just have to save those for next time. We're so glad that you, you um, made this part of your, your time out West. I'm so grateful to you, and if anyone wants to, you know, reach out with more questions, I'm always reachable. I, I don't want to not be part of this community now, so you can reach me um, online, and and I, I'd love to help uh, Grace in any way I can going forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.